Rynuske? Rynuske. Did I get it right? I'm close. No. Nope, not even. What? <laughs> Back with more Akutagawa. We are looking at yam gruel, one of the top dishes for them samurai today. <laughs> Man, I love sweet potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet potato pie. My brother-in-law's mom makes the best sweet potato pie. And you only get it once a year at Thanksgiving, right? That's right. The big, ban- <laughs> the big banquet. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I want some sweet potato pie crypto. If you are new around these parts, we take a conversational approach to literature, talking about some of the most important stories that have influenced even today's authors. If you're down for that, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. Yam Gruel was published in 1916, and our version was translated by Takashi Kojima. Ryunosuke Akutagawa, one of the most famous Japanese writers, well known for Rashomon and the Centennial Criterion Collection film. Today, he's even celebrated with the Akutagawa Prize. Today, we are looking at Yam Gruel. Starting off with themes, this story has three main themes. We're looking at desire versus satiation, appearances, and of course, our good old favorite, class struggles. We are going to do the quick plot recap to make sure that we are all on the same page. And then we'll talk a little bit of uh, the story here with discussion analysis. So for plot, we get a character sketch of Goi a fifth rank samurai who lives a homely and meager life, appears shabby to most in society. However, Goy is unique in his desire for his favorite food, yam gruel, <laughs> which, which motivates him in life. Now, on January 2nd, at a banquet at the Palace of Motosne, a grand feast was given where class divide did not separate anyone. At the banquet, Goi was teased by Fujiwara Toshiotto, son of the finance minister, in front of others for wanting more than the meager serving he had received of his favorite dish, yam gruel. Now later, you can't say Toshi- it like that every time. You're gonna make me I laugh. do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that every single time. Now later, Toshiotto <laughs> invites Goi to ride to a hot spring and get yam gruel. <laughs> <laughs> However, after leaving, they ride further and further into the country where it is lonely and more ridden with bandits. It's only after they are well upon their way that Goi has realized where Toshihoto is bringing him far away. And suddenly realizing how far they must travel, Goi wishes he had brought his servant with him to help him press on. Soon they stumble upon a fox. Toshihoto catches the fox and tells him to warn his mansion people to prepare for him as, as they continue down the road and they'll meet them there tomorrow. So they, he kicks the fox on its way. <laughs> they arrive in Turuga. Is it Turuga? I wrote down Turuga. I don't know if that's correct. My handwriting's terrible. And the next day, Toshihoto's 20 vassals are outside awaiting his arrival. Apparently, Fox Messenger of the Gods apparently works. <laughs> One of them tells them about the strange phenomenon, about how the ladyship had informed them on his arrival to the uh, to, to the castle to prepare for, for his arrival. And the house had plenty of nice clothes, baths, and all the servants were ordered to bring yams that were three inches wide by five feet <laughs> to dinner. The next day, Goy wakes up and sees, stacked up to the roof height, yams, yams, yams. <laughs> and they serve Goy yam gruel. <laughs> they tell him not to be hesitant and to continue and insist upon him eating more of this favorite dish. But Goy insists that he's full. He's had his, his fill even before starting, oddly enough. He kind of sees the fox he sneezes into a silver pitcher and plot. Oh, one of those plots. Ugh, come on, Akutagawa. <laughs> you got to give me more. He does this on purpose, I swear. <laughs> All right, moving into our analysis, let's talk about this narration at the banquet to begin with. We have really interesting quotes, to me at least, where he'll say things like, in this respect, they differ greatly from the present-day writers of the naturalist school. However, the naturalists of the Heian period were not as leisurely as might be expected. The writers of these works evidently took very little interest in the lives or stories of common people. And boom, he's like, yep, we're talking about class. Like, 
lower class, we ain't writing about them, right? We only talk about the important people. Yeah, it's just so obvious that so many writers try to equate that, hey, the key to happiness is not money. And I'm going to prove it to you because as you become gluttonous or greedy with something, you're not going to feel what you think you're going to feel or get what you think you're going to get. Yeah, and I think that's hitting on the nose right there. Not to... Oh, to... I see what you did there. <laughs> not to be the, not to play the pun, but I think that's hitting it on the nose right there where, where Akuta got was going with this one. And he, he wrote about class a lot. Like I think in every single discussion, it comes up at some point in his short stories that that was something that was very clear that he wanted to write about and he even like pick, picks up the story from present day i mean you said this was what 1922 oh 16 you said 16 right and he puts it you know thousands of years in the past because he's very clearly like hey guys remember the feudal system when we were separated by rank and had to wear different clothes and had to treat people differently based on their rank he's very clearly attacking this concept because this is kind of this is meiji era right this are this is kind of at the post end late meiji isn't it the meiji restoration is 1868 to 1912 1914 ish you can kind of make an argument of when quote it ends but he's definitely writing during this time period of class change and divide and restriction between all the different peoples of, of the era. And the food, I feel like, is really important because that brings us into the story. A lot of critics will write about The Dead by James Joyce. His description and depiction of the food just pulls the reader into the story. And I think we get a little bit of that in the intro with the banquet, right? We're hit with this class divide, this concept about how art reflects life in the beginning. And then boom, we're sucked into the story, you know, and I'm not the first one to, to bring this up, but I would say there's a couple of intertextual conversations that we can have with this too. Some people have pointed out, and I fully agree with this one. We, we start out with this character of Goy, Right. He's referred to by his dang class, Goy. Like he's not even given a name. He's called his class. Ouch. And he's he right, he well, he's made fun of at this banquet. Um, he has to dress meagerly. He doesn't look as nice as the others that get paid more in, in this different feudal system era of Japan. And um he's kind of made fun of, but I guess I don't think you've meant are meant to felt a, a lot of empathy in the beginning of the story. Like Akutagawa makes it very funny and humorous to kick off. And then what happens is he drops this line where he's like, why would you do that to me? Like, it's this moment where there's like a flip from like a reader's perspective where as soon as he says that, you're like, oh, well, now I feel kind of bad for laughing at him. You know, this he's living this meager, meager life. It's not his choice. It's it's his class in a sense. You're like, a oh, lot of wait a minute. I'm the bad guy? No, that's not right. Don't do this to me. <laughs> uh... <laughs> And if you remember, another story that we've done on this channel does that exact same thing, and that's The Overcoat by Nikolai Gogol, where there's that one oh, line okay. that's very famous for that flip from, from starting out as a comedy and kind of class goofiness and then flips it into a real person where you suddenly feel bad and all of a sudden you're behind him and he's the underdog that you're rooting for, right? That's the beginning structure of this story. And, and Akutagawa, again, you know, we talk about the pimple in his uh, other stories, such as like Rashomon or in, in, in the Grove. There's all these depictions. Here we've got that dang red nose and that goofy mustache, right? Yeah, <laughs> this is the thing that I really latched on to this story. And I remember learning about Asian cultures as a young man and that a lot of the Asian cultures really fetishize on our looks and appearance as a person. And that's something that is very, very important in not just, I think, Japanese culture, but many Asian societies is your appearance and, you know, holding yourself regal and esteemed. And in this story, we see him made fun of his mustache. They make fun of his, quote, stupid smile. And one of the quotes that really stuck out to me was when it says, his face gave the impression that ever since birth, he had a cold-looking red nose. And it's it's interesting how Gutakawa really plays up these physical deformities almost to a, a comical level of ridiculousness. I kept wanting to make the comic joke of, 
all the other samurai wouldn't let him play in the samurai games. Cause like, <laughs> they kept talking about the dang red nose. Like I, I really wanted to make Rudolph jokes, even though I know Rudolph was kind of like World War II, I think like 1939 era that that became kind of official. So obviously this predates that and is that anachronistic, but it kept making me think of the dang Rudolph because of the physical deformity of the mustache and his red nose, which is typically representative of drunk or lower class. I think a lot of old Asian, uh, very characteristic, you know, depictions uh, point paint people. And that was Goy in this story. And I, I really like the part where he like becomes nauseous because of like the rice getting stuck in his mustache. And you just you see that this this the mustache and the nose and his appearance and everything really leads to an imbalance in his life. And I think that goes back to this idea of that there's an imbalance in Japan between the different peoples. And we see that as Agutaga was writing this during the Meiji Restoration, that things are not equal or they're not going to be equal unless they address them. We have the quote, The shy Goi had almost always been too timid to translate into action whatever he might have really felt. But on this occasion, since they were children, he could muster up some courage. Please, spare him, he said, smiling as broadly as possible and patting the shoulder of the boy, who seemed the oldest of the group. If you hit the dog, you'll hurt him. And while this could just be them talking about a dog, Akutagawa, master writer of the short story, never puts anything into a story unless there's really a purpose. And I think what he's doing in here, along with other parts, like we'll get to with the fox, they're talking about class in a surrogate relationship where they're talking about a human being superior to a dog. We can beat that dog, mistreat it, et cetera, et cetera, and not feel bad about it. But here comes Goy saying, you shouldn't treat those that you think are just because they're lesser. You have to treat everyone with respect, basically. And I think this comes down to the class discussion, because compare this to the fox, which is, you know, very famous in, in Japanese lore and mythology. But it is considered higher class. It is considered a god or upper class. And you'll see that they have this deference, this, this treatment where they say things such as, he's a messenger of the gods, isn't he, sir? Giving vent to his naive wonder and admiration, Goy looked up all the more respectfully into the face of the fierce knight who commanded the willing service of even a fox. So you see that deference here. And I think this is that conversation of, do you treat people of upper class or lower class differently because of their social class standing. I think this comes down to a good guy was trying to tell people, hey, it doesn't matter your station. It matters how you treat people. And a good judge of how people will treat people is how they treat animals. Because once he sees the command over the fox, his admiration kind of changes for him, right? I would say so. And, and this is directly comparable to at that scene, we have the servants and the footmen who have to run behind them. And they even have the horses that they ride upon, right? You have Goy, who is very homely and meager looking. And then you have Toshihito, who is upper class, but they're, they're riding on steeds and people will, will look at these steeds and look at them and have a certain class uh, assumptions based on how they're dressed and what animal they're riding. Yeah, I think this is great because we see this combination in, in such a short piece, all of the themes of socioeconomic appearance and a little bit of history of Japan and what they're doing and how they're moving forward. I think it brings out maybe like the the point of the story, right? Yeah, I think it comes down to desire, right? Sometimes we have the desire to move up a class. We admire those. The grass is always greener on the other side, right? And we even have to throw into this picture... Yam gruel! <laughs> <laughs> because we have these quotes, but as a matter of fact, it would hardly be too much to say that he lived for this purpose. A man sometimes devotes his life to a desire which he is not sure will ever be fulfilled. Those who laugh at this folly are, after all, no more than mere spectators of life. What do you think about that one? <sighs> I think that like you said, we're always looking at something that we can't have and that if we get it, uh, we're going to be happy. And I think that Goy realizes that when he has what he finally wants, he isn't truly happy. And 
then we see at the very end of the story what happens to him. He sneezes and we come back to his nose again. And I think he has kind of a realization that, wow, this isn't all it cracked up to be to completely get what you want. Sometimes the desire is enough, right? We have quotes like, naturally enough, when Goy, who had watched these things, was served yam gruel in a huge (laughs) pitcher, he felt satiated even before tasting the delicacy. And this couldn't help but make me think of the people that buy lottery tickets. They know they're not going to win. Most likely, the odds of someone winning the lottery are so small. But arguably, some people, I mean, they're buying it to win, right? Don't get me wrong. But some people realize that what they're really buying is that 15, 30-minute fantasy where they sit there and think, what would I do with my winnings? You know, what? How, how could I live just such a luxurious and glorious life? But you'll notice there's, I mean, this is well-documented. People that win the lottery end up just in ruination They go bankrupt, they waste their money, and they're unhappy a lot of the times, not all the time. But it's that concept, too, I think, of sometimes your desire was more important than the obtaining. And I know there's people out there like, dude, I would be so happy with a million dollars. Okay, go read the stats, and you will see (laughs) how sometimes people just become so greedy, constantly wanting, wanting to move up in class, wanting that yam gruel. Whatever that desire is, that's your fire. Keep that. Because that's more important than obtaining. And that's what's going to keep you happy sometimes and keep you motivated to move through life, to travel way farther than the city that you thought you were going to go on to get that thing that you wanted. But then just like Goy here, once you obtain it, sometimes you realize you were already satiated. It was that desire, that passion. Sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. Yeah, I love that. That that that's the case, right? And I think that this is a great lesson that a lot of people, especially young people can take from this is that you don't know exactly what you want out of life except for maybe those impulses and those urges. And food is one of them, right? It gives you almost instant satisfaction. But one of the things I think that a Gutagawa is doing here is that your relationships that you have are something that you also have to keep mindful of because you might have a crush or you might have a love and he had this love of yam gruel and once he gets it it doesn't satiate him it's kind of like if you have that crush on that person and you finally get them you may realize that they aren't going to fulfill the needs that you have or they're not going to meet those expectations of when you put them up on a pedestal and we see that so often here we see a, you know a great fictional story that is giving you what you wish for and you don't actually get it absolutely lovely story another akutagawa slam dunk if you ask me we will leave a playlist down below where you can check out all of our other akutagawa talks crypto hit me with your subjective ratings on this one subjective analytical all around i'm going to give this one an 8.5 the writing doesn't get much better than this so much to talk about so relevant to today and it was funny uh i really liked the stories i felt really bad for goy and I kind of thought about myself of like, wow, I should have felt bad for this guy the whole time, but I didn't. And I think that's where stories are important and why it's important to read and feed your brain is it's going to help you know more about yourself. And this definitely is one of those great stories for developing your own character and your own needs and desires and what you want out of life. I love this story. The The act of reading Akutagawa is always such a pleasure. He has to be one of my top five authors. I want to know, if you guys out there are watching this and you've never read an Akutagawa, why? He is such a fantastic writer. You have to experience this. With that said, I don't think Yam Gruel is the place to start. I would say this is long. I enjoyed reading it, but I would say the output from reading it probably wasn't as much as like, you know, his stories like Rashomon or or In a Grove. So I got to dock it a few points on that. But like the act of reading it was so pleasurable and so much fun. Always great conversation with with Akutagawa. I'll I'll go with 8.5 as well. Probably the lowest (laughs) Akutagawa rating I could possibly give. Your statement is so irony, right? The journey this, is better uh, than the, the destination. <laughs> it really is. Like, right? I, I, I have to read uh, everything this man wrote. I do. Like, he is uh, so Don't do amazing. that. You got to leave one at the end and never read it. 
because otherwise you'll be disappointed. Because I'll be disappointed. The desire You'll have your yam gruel fill. <laughs> I want to read everything by him. Therefore, I will not. <laughs> Guys, You've learned your lesson. We, we post videos every Monday and Thursday in a conversational manner. Hit that subscribe button if that sounds like you. Una out. Peace.